Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and welcome to this episode of the Phil Cook Podcast. Today, we're going to be interviewing Fred Applegate. Now, Fred is an actor. He's been a career actor, I mean, his entire adult life. He's been on television, major television programs, major movies, major Broadway shows, particularly high-end musicals. You're going to hear a lot about how to survive in the entertainment business today. He's an incredibly creative guy, had a long career, and we're going to talk about creativity. We're going to talk about how to get into the industry how to make a career of it, how to make your career really go for the long haul. We want to all have a, a long, successful career, and it's going to be a fascinating conversation, so stay tuned. So, Fred, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast today. This is fantastic. Um, you and I go way back, and you certainly had a really long, long career. So, Hey, hey um, not long, long. Let's go with long. <laughs> Okay, kind of short, medium. Okay, yeah. that works. Well, let's let's go back to the beginning here. Um, where did you grow up? Where did all this start? I grew up in New Jersey, um, in South Orange and Maplewood, New Jersey. And if you want to know where it all started, when I was seven years old, I was uh, a Siamese child in a high school production of The King and I, something that really shouldn't happen anymore. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I loved it. And I was seven years old and told my father that I was going to be an actor. And his reaction was to ask me, how do you do that? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you should find out. Well, that's a good question for a dad. Now, was anybody in your family in the entertainment business at all? No. Nobody? No. All right. So where, So, how did you find out? What was next? I liked doing that. King and I thing. So I did every opportunity I could get to perform or do a play or a musical in elementary school. And fortunately, I went to a school in New Jersey uh, back in the day when schools had arts budgets. Yeah. Um, we did a full musical with a band in middle school when I was in seventh grade. And my high school did a full musical with an orchestra every year. And we did a full on play and some really uh, adventurous stuff. We did Archibald McLeish's JB. We did uh, RUR, wow. uh, the, the play that invented the term robot. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ah Wilderness and a bunch of musicals. Wow. And so, uh, you know, it made sense to me that this could be a life. And you decided to follow up in college. Where did you go to school? Northwestern University. And you studied acting? Did you study theater there? Yeah. And you did some work at the Guth Guthrie. Was that right after college? Tell me a little bit about what happened there. Right after college, I went and I auditioned for um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof at a dinner theater in Rock Island, Illinois, which amazingly is still there called Circa 21 Dinner Playhouse. And uh, aside from my first experience of, you know, uh, a full week and full rehearsals in the professional world, I met the woman who was to become my wife. Um, Sherry. Yeah. She played my daughter. I was Tevya and she played Huddle. Uh, my daughter, she's the one who sings um, Far From the Home I Love. She's going off to be with her, her husband, Perchik. And uh, I, I noticed that in rehearsal, I turned to leave her at the train station and Tevya says, to the to God, he says, take good care of her and make sure she dresses warm. And in rehearsals, for the first time in my life, I think, I actually started to cry at the prospect that Sherry would be leaving. So I thought, well, that's strange. Who is this person? <laughs> Very interesting. And you ended up marrying and being together all this time. That's remarkable. So what brought you to, to Los Angeles? Did you come to L.A. first or New York first? Well, I did that stint at did three years at that dinner theater. And then we moved yeah. to Minneapolis because I wanted to work at the Guthrie. And by the in, through the intervention of some friends, I was hired at the Guthrie. I spent three years in the company there. And then we took a two week vacation in Los Angeles and we're still here. <laughs> um, again, the, the intervention of friends. One of my best friends in college, John Scheinfeld, was director of, of comedy development at MTM at the time. Oh, and wow. he brought me in for a general 
with their casting department and they didn't have anything. And, you know, I'm just, you know, John's friend, Whoopi. And uh, they read me for this small part in an episode of Newhart that had been cut from the show. So it was just something to read. So I read for them. A couple of days later, they put it back in the show. I was the only person they'd seen for it. And apparently I was good enough. It was three lines. Uh, and I can handle three lines. And <laughs> they, put, they put the part back in the show. And she called me and said, you, you want to do it? And I said, yeah. So they hired me for the show. And that same day, I was cast in a Toyota National commercial uh, in L.A. And I took Sherry out to dinner and I said, this is easy. <laughs> Little did I know. I didn't work another day for nine months. Wow. Not another day. And my pregnant wife and I rented a house in Los Angeles and moved and died on the vine. Wow. So... Wow. You know, let's go back a little bit, you know, back to the theater days, the, the earlier theater days. The thing that really stands out for me is that I don't think enough people think of this today is you were willing to do any part, anywhere, anytime. I mean, I remember directing early on, right after college, I would do hot tub commercials. I would do TV evangelist, anything it took, I was ready to work. And, and I think people today just expect the big job to fall in your lap and very often aren't willing to... Uh, I, I meet people all the time that say, well, I've had this opportunity, but I didn't think it was good enough for me. Or I've had this opportunity, but that's not really what I want to focus on. Let me tell you, I think you hone your craft by doing everything that you could possibly do. Is that, I mean, would you look at, at it that way? Absolutely. Uh, if, if you think your first job is going to be where you want to wind up, first of all, I don't think you should want to wind up anywhere. I think you should yeah. just want the journey. And your first job isn't going to be your dream job. Um, when I talk to students, I always say, always be doing something. There's nothing to wait for. Yeah. There is nothing yeah. to wait for. If you're waiting, that's what you've chosen to do. Nothing. Boy, that's true. That's a really good word. And I'm, I'm finding more and more actors these days are tr out producing stuff. They, they're not willing to just you know, wait and wait and wait and wait. Let's stay busy. Let's stay active. If I can't find a part, let's create a part. So I love that, that sense of hustle. I just think that's fantastic. Really good. You've got to be doing something because you, if yeah. like anything, building a chair, your fourth chair is not as good as your 400th chair. Yeah. So you just got to keep honing your craft and doing it and experiencing it to get it in your bones. Well, you know, after that nine months of doing nothing, when you finally got to L.A., what, what was the first thing that really broke for you? Or is anything significant happened right after that? Well, what I learned was uh, how tough the business is and how many times you have to slam your head into the wall and get over it. True. 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 But what happened next was, again, the intervention of friends. I had an audition at the Taper, the Mark Taper Forum. Uh, the theater in downtown LA. Yep. And the associate artistic director had worked with me at the Guthrie and had moved to Los Angeles and tried to get me an audition with Gordon Davidson, the man who yeah. found him and ran, ran. Uh, and they were reticent to see me because I was nobody, I had no cred, and it was the West Coast, and that's a whole yeah. different world until. Gordon Davidson found out that I had done an episode of um, Prairie Home Companion. And he was a huge fan of Prairie Home Companion. And he brought me in and we sat at a table and talked about Prairie Home Companion for 45 minutes. I don't think I actually read from either of the plays he was casting. We just talked about Prairie Home Companion and they hired me. So I did the summer rep at the taper in 1984. And in the fall, I got started being seen for things again. And then things started to click because I'd been at the taper. 
Well, I, I did my research here, and I was going over your list of TV credits. We'll get to theater and film and stuff in a minute, but, you know, back in those days in TV, you did um, Remington, you know, you did New Heart, like you mentioned, but you did Hill Street Blues and Remington Steel and Seinfeld episodes, uh, Murphy Brown, Northern Exposure ER. I got my act together here. Um, even Jeff Foxworthy show. I mean, you did Drew Carey, Touched by an Angel, Will and Grace, Malcolm in the Middle, and and, and it's ta- it's gone up to now. I mean, you did Marvelous Ms. Mais- Mrs. Maple, Ma- Maisel, which I think is a fantastic, fantastic show. Um, you've just, I think the, the cool thing about you is you've just stayed steadily busy for a long time. What's the secret to rolling one thing into another? How do you do that? Oh, if I only knew. I, <laughs> I charge a lot of money for a seminar. Uh <laughs> It just, I mean, actually, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, that's not bad. The charging a lot of money part. Um, <laughs> the, it's just that thing. You've got to keep doing things. Um, I, I love doing Mrs. Maisel because uh, Rachel Brosnahan, I, I think, is a brilliant actor and a brilliant yeah. comedian. She reminded me of a, a Lucille Ball quote. Lu, Lucille Ball said, I'm not funny. I'm brave. Interesting. And that's what Rachel Brosnahan brings. She mm-hmm. is fearless. Yeah. Um, she's also tiny. I mean, a microscopic human baby. Uh, <laughs> so I really enjoyed doing that show. But I have done shows over the years, and I won't mention them. Not happy. Yeah. Not a happy set. Not a great character. Not great writing. Um Really squeezing to get a laugh out of what I was given and getting a lot of heat from producers and directors because their script wasn't funny. Yeah. Cause you always blame the guest star. I mean, that, that should be emblazoned and a sampler at all the studios blame the guest star. <laughs> um, it's understandable human behavior. Yes. Well, it, the other thing too is, as a guest star, every time you go in, you're going into an, a completely new environment with new people and new circumstances, a new set, a new vibe, a, a new culture, how, how can you, you know, you have to be, I would think you'd have to be really, really flexible to be, you know, I'm a director and a producer, so I kind of determine the environment and the culture of my sets and who I'm going to be with. But in the, in a guest star role in particular, you're walking into a new situation every time. How, what do you have to, what, what do you have to be thinking about to be able to be comfortable like that? And I didn't start out this way, but what I've learned over the years is you have to know who you are, what you're doing and why you're there. And you have to honor why you're there. You're not there to be the star of the episode. You're not there to get a series. You're there to service the principles and tell the story. If you if you get to create a character, that's a bonus. Wow. But you keep the show moving, you serve the principles. And you know that if you have a speech that's five lines long, you'll be on camera for one line, and four of the lines are going to be reaction shots from the people who make the big money. True. And you just have to accept that there's a mechanism working and your job is to understand the mechanism and feed it. Because if you're there for your own ego or you think you're going to be a star or you're going to be a breakout thing for you and you're going to redefine television, (laughs) it's a good way to stop working. (laughs) That's true. That's good. That's good. Well, you know, I I think as you were saying that, I thought that um, just having people skills is a powerful thing. People understand. I just don't think people in our business understand the importance of just people skills, getting along with people. I I saw a statistic the other day that said something like 70 percent of the people that were fired. This was this came out. This was a study that came out right before COVID, so it was back when everybody was working normally. Um, and they said something like 70% of the people that had been fired that year weren't fired because they were incompetent or they couldn't do the job. They were fired because they couldn't get along with other people in the office. And I just don't think people understand the ability to walk into a new situation and be comfortable with people. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard, especially in an audition when you have maybe five eight minutes to make an impression. Yeah. Um, And I know several acting teachers who I respect who talk about, you're not there to get the job. There's nothing you can do to get the job. You're there to show them you're a good actor. That's good. But the other part of that is you're there to show them you're a good person to have in the room. Uh 
Yeah. It's not, I'm going to show you that you want to hire me. I'm going to show you that I understand your project and I'm ready to work with you. That's good. This is what I can bring. Please give me your feedback. How can I serve you better? Um, be yourself, be, you know, have your integrity and do what you think needs to be done. But it's, you have to make them comfortable with you in the room. Um, that I learned early on. Uh, you, you walk in, they're all nervous. Yeah. And actors don't remember that. They're all nervous because what if they don't find the guy? Yeah. Um, so you go in and you do your best to reassure them that you're a comfortable guy to have in the room. You understand what they're doing and you want to help them and work together. You know, I, I, I talked to a producer on that thought. I talked to a producer this morning who said that he'd rather have a team of, you know, a slightly above average people that loved working together and were really comfortable with each other than a team with a few superstars that couldn't get along. And I think that goes, goes right to what you're saying. Yeah. But I, I know superstars who do get along, who Which set great. the tone, who set the tone for the room that is collaborative and relaxed and blame free and uh, creative. Uh, and they're not all like that. And the ones who aren't like that, I've actually be at this point in my life, I feel sorry for them. Yeah, that's true. They could be so much happier at work if they established that ethic because, you know, as my father used to say, the fish stinks from the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can tell right away when you walk onto a set um, how the, smish, the fish smells. All right, be, be specific for a minute. You don't have to mention names or anything or shows, but what is the problem, the, the biggest problem you see on a set, in a crew, on a, on a team like that? What, what are the, the, looking back over your career, what are the things that drove you nuts the most? Being treated as if you're either a burden or being treated as if you're not there. It, it doesn't take any effort to walk up to the guest star, shake their hand and say, welcome aboard. We're going to have a great week. Good luck. Happy to have you here. My name is whatever. Um, yeah. It doesn't take anything away from you to do that. I don't understand that. Um, I'll give you a name. Brian Cranston yeah. makes everyone feel that they're as valuable to the work as he is, whether it's wow. in the theater or whether it's in television. I did uh, Malcolm in the Middle with Brian and we have mutual friends in New York and I go see whatever he's in and uh, just a real solid pro. And for me, a solid pro isn't somebody who always knocks it out of the park, but it's someone who at the end of the run, everyone wants to keep in touch with. That's good. That's good. So tell me about type. I don't know if the, you know, if I should call it typecasting or, you know, playing to type. D do you feel like over your career, did you play a certain type of role, a certain niche? Did you find a niche that, that you could specialize in or do, have you played a little bit of everything? Eventually. And what, do you, and what do you recommend along that line? Oh yeah. Well, typecasting, there's two types of typecasting let's call type one, is when you do a role in a show for a long time, yep. and that's who you're identified as. Mr. Spock. That's incredibly hard to break out of. Yeah. Um, and I do, my heart goes out to people who get locked in a role and can't get anyone to see them as anyone else. But what the producers are thinking is, the audience is going to, this guy's going to walk in and they're going to see that character from that show. And that's all. Yeah. The other type of typecasting is when you do, when you're constantly doing guest work and you're the, um, you know, the jolly fat guy or the nervous skinny guy or the Don Knotts type or the, yeah. uh, you know, one type or another. And those are the only roles you're offered. Well, I look at Daniel Craig during his whole James Bond run. He was constantly doing other oddball roles and different different kind of characters and stuff, trying his best probably and to theater. do the same thing. And he was doing theater. Oh, that's right. He was doing theater. That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly every, right. Every break he had from Bond, he would go do a play. 
That's interesting. Uh, That's where you're good. not locked in. No one, no one goes to you know a, a, a mammoth play and expects to see James Bond, even if it's right. Daniel Craig. He gets to create a different character, but not on film. That's harder to get people to do. Okay, so you, you you're going along in in your television career here, doing well here in L.A. Um, what got you back to Broadway? What got you back to theater in a, on a big level? Well. Just before I came out here in the 70s, TV was a very specific type of work. Yeah. It started to morph in the 80s. And by the 90s, it had gone from, you know, Charlie's Angels to, um, oh, I can't think of an example, but um, all those 70s hour shows yeah. had become much more serious and TV had become much more dark. Uh, and the comedies had gone from Bob Newhart and Andy Griffith to how young a kid can we get to say this terribly inappropriate thing yeah, so that people will have a nervous laugh? Or how old a person can we have be snarky and sarcastic? So it went from the sitcoms were something you could experience in your own life and became sitcoms that were about that sitcom. Yeah. And the lines just got snarkier and snarkier and snarkier. And to me, it eventually became not funny. And uh, the hour shows sort of moved on past me. I was stuck in the, my type was more of an early eighties, late seventies sitcom, half hour stuff. And I was getting bored. And TV was saying, um, yeah, you know, we've, you've had your run. So I decided to go back to the theater. And I did uh, the taper again. I did an experimental theater piece. I did a new play by an American playwright, Doris Baisley. Um, so I did Beauty and the Beast in Los Angeles at the Schubert Theater. Yep. And the casting director for the L.A. production of Beauty and the Beast, he was already playing on Broadway, was casting Sound of Music revival on Broadway and brought me in for that. And I flew to New York and auditioned for that and got it and spent a year in New York doing Sound of Music and then came home back to Los Angeles. And I now had a Broadway credits. So all of a sudden theaters in LA that were never interested in seeing me were all of a sudden interested in seeing me. Interesting. So I did some, you know, I, I did a, I, won't, I don't need to name names, but I did a Chekhov and got a good write-up in the Times, and uh, I got another series that uh, got on the air, but didn't last. And I realized that while the people I worked with on that series were lovely, uh, really lovely people, um, it wasn't, wasn't doing anything for me. Um, so I refocused myself to New York. And uh, uh, my friend Gary Beach, of, of great memory, yeah. uh, was uh, uh, Roger Debris, the eccentric director, and they were sending the tour out. And he called me and he said in very direct and perhaps somewhat crude terms, get your parts out here and audition for this tour. So uh, on my own dime, I spent a week in New York. Uh, I did get a, a, this is after all my experience, I'm still a new kid in New York. So I have a general audition with the assistant casting director for the producers. And I'm not incompetent. So I see the casting director <laughs> and I'm not incompetent. So I see the choreographer to see if I can do the choreography. And I'll just say I'm not incompetent. <laughs> Only Wikipedia thinks I'm a dancer. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not incompetent. And then I get to see Susan Stroman and she likes what I'm doing. And this is like taking a week. And uh, that night I go home and um, I hear that Mel Brooks wants to meet me. So I go back the next day and I walk in the room and I'm so nervous um, and overwhelmed by the room and Mel Brooks sitting right there that I had to do something to spell that vibe. So I walked in and I realized this in retrospect might have been really stupid, but it worked. I completely ignored Mel Brooks, like he wasn't even in the room. 
I knew some of the producers and I met the choreographer, the assistant choreographer. So I walked right past Mel. He stood up when I walked in the room, walked right past him and said hello to everyone I knew on the table. And I started working my way up the table until there was Mel. And I stood in front of him. I said, so you're Mel Brooks. <laughs> and, and he laughed. Thank God. Um, and I said, you're very funny. And he said, thank you. Are you? A good response. <laughs> and I said, well, let's see. And I did the audition. And I, at the end, he thanked me, shook my hand, and he said, you know, you are funny. I said, thank you. So I left. And that night, my flight back to L.A. was the next morning. And I'd been in New York for a week on my own dime. And yeah. it's not cheap. Right. Um, and they called me that night and they said, um, Mel might want to see you tomorrow. And I said, well, I'm flying back in the morning. Well, Mel might want to see you. I said, well, I'm flying out in the morning. So I got on the plane and in the air, I got the job. Wow. Um, and I did the producers. This, the, the reason this is so significant, I did the tour for two years, they sent me to Broadway as Max, the lead role, uh, after an injury. One of the guys on Broadway had an injury. They sent me to Broadway for three months. I finished the tour. They sent me to England to do yeah. uh, the, to star above the title on the West End for a year. Yeah. So I, I wound up doing the producers one production or another for four years. Uh, above the title and I really needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> I had two kids at a private university. Yeah. And that's tough. When I was in London, they were both, well, they both went, my two older kids went to Northwestern. Uh, I was making a lot of money. They were at Northwestern and all of the money went to Northwestern. So <laughs> I bet. Okay. So, so, and you took over uh, the, the last phase of it was taken over from Nathan Lane as the lead on Broadway. Um, how many performances do you think you did of the producers looking back? 1,350. 1,350 performances of the producers. Yep. Ooh, is that the longest run you ever did on a show? Well, that's several different productions. Yeah, that's true. And you did, you did a lot on, on Wicked as the yeah. wizard. You, yeah. I don't know how many you did there. How many did you do there? Well, I did Broadway. Then I did a six month tour and then I was back on Broadway. So I did it for about 18 months, which would be 600 plus performances. Um, the longest run I did was uh, Young Frankenstein. I stayed with that for a year and a half. So that was 600 plus in a row. Wow. So that's a different skill. For, I was going to say, for those of us outside that acting world, what does it take to keep the role alive when you're doing 600, you know, do after doing it 600 times, how do you just mentally keep the thing vibrant and alive? Well, it does, you know, a little, um, cause you, sometimes you have, you don't have all the resources. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're not well, sometimes something hurts. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you do the best you can, but it, for me, it really, is about respect. You go to the theater, there are people counting on you. Other actors, the ensemble, um, they're counting on you to do your job. Not to mention the audience. Not to mention the audience. But, yeah. you know, you don't always know all of them. You know, when 2,000 people sitting out there, you don't know them. But, you know, the people you're seeing backstage, you have a responsibility to bring it and to bring everything you have. Um, I also tell students, I don't, I don't believe in 90%, 110%, you know, 200%. You're either doing it or you're not. And if you think you're doing 90%, you're not doing it at all. Well, along that line, let's, let's, let's go to Fred, the mentor now, and uh, give me some advice. If I was a young actor or just, you know, get out, get out. <laughs> sell insurance, get your real estate license. Um, 
you know, say a young creative in any area, you know, directing, writing, whatever, designing. Um, give me some advice. What would you tell young people watching or listening to this? Always have something that you're doing. Create something. You know, the thing now is content creators. Yeah. Which, which is a variable bar. I mean, there are people who think <laughs> turning sideways and showing you their figure is yes. creating content. And it is, but that's bad content. Yes. Um, but you can create a five minute video and with some real effort and some real writing um, to show not that you're alive. I mean, some of these videos are like, okay, you're alive. That is all yeah. I've learned. And this is an old video. You might not be. Um, do, you know, force yourself to create something. Well, I tell, I t when I meet filmmakers here in LA, um, I, I'm constantly telling them that, uh, you know, you got a television studio in your pocket now that you have an iPhone or an Android phone. The cameras are amazing. Um, when I, when I started in the business, a, 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 t a broadcast TV camera cost a quarter of a million dollars. Now there are feature film festivals in the country just for movies made on iPhones. So right. there's really not much of an excuse not to be out there creating something. Right. There's more content. So there's more competition and there's a lot more noise so it's a lot harder to get noticed but you know it wasn't more than 30 25 years ago that you had to come up with money for film yeah totally uh, you, you can make a half an hour short film for no cost yeah for materials you had to get you know 16 millimeter film then you had to have it directed and you had to have it edited Processed, edited, color corrected. Everything. It was a lot of money, as you well know. Yeah. It cost a lot of money. Okay, so what's your advice from a lifetime of auditions? What's your advice about going into the room for the first time? Whether it's a pitch meeting, whether it's an audition, whether it's a presentation, um, or just the first time you meet Mel Brooks, you know, somebody, something like that. And after all your auditions you've done, give me some advice. Well, I, I didn't take my own advice with Mel Brooks because I was terrified. <laughs> I mean, it was Mel Brooks. Yeah, that's right. And I wanted something from him. And I'm stealing from my friend Michael Kostrov's book about auditioning. He said, the first thing you need to realize is you're not going to get the job. You're not going to get it. Let it go. You are not going to get the job. But what else can you do while you're there? Good. And what you can do is act. Yeah. You can act for five minutes on a Tuesday afternoon with a good piece of material that you can prepare well and you can enjoy given, being given the chance to act for five minutes. And hopefully make a lasting impression. What will make the impression is the joy you bring to the ability to create even if it's a drama and even if you're supposed to cry and, you know, somebody dies and you're crushed and all that stuff, but your own excitement and energy at the, at the opportunity to show someone your craft is going to be infectious. All of those people want you to succeed. They all really do want you to be who they're looking for. Looking back, I now know at my lowest points when I was the most unhappy um, cause you can fail and be happy. I mean, things yeah. can fall apart and you can still be happy. It's weird, but it's true. But when things were failing and I was at the absolute lowest point, I realized that's because I was the center of my world. Just I had made myself the most important thing in my life. And you excuse that to yourself by saying, well, I have a family to provide for. I have children to provide for. I have to make this happen. And I have to do this and I have to do that. And this has to happen. And it's all, you slowly move the center of your world into yourself. And there's no there there. <laughs> you know, there's, it's just, you're not gonna move from there. Um, but what I've learned was that when I think outside of myself, when I think about other people, when I think about my family's happiness, when I think about my children's success, um, and when I think about putting myself into the world and caring about things that are happening that perhaps I can affect, 
that don't have to do with me, I get a little lighter. Because if I say, you know, I'm doing okay, I need this to happen and this to happen, but you know, there are hungry people and I can do something about that. And there are immigrants who are suffering because they don't speak the language, they don't have resources, nobody cares about them. I can do something about that. So when I do go to church, sit with my, my friends, my church uh, family, and see that the whole world operates completely independent of me, <laughs> completely independent of me. And it's a, it's a good reminder every, at least every week, sometimes a couple times a week to go sit there, be with God and look around and say, look at all these people on a journey just like mine. Some of them are doing better than me. Some of them are scraping. Some of them are frustrated. Some of them are joyful. Some of them are old. Some of them are young. We're all on this journey toward the same thing. And what I do for a living doesn't really matter that much. That's good. In terms of where I want to be and how I want to get there. Well, I remember over the years, you've told me stories from time to time about how someone in the cast may be struggling with something. They may be going through some difficult challenge in their life. And, uh, you know, you, you, never, you never waved a religious flag or made a big deal about, you know, having any kind of religious faith, but they always seem to find their way to you. And I think that's a, that's a great place to be where you, you're living that life so well that people who are struggling notice and they're attracted well, to that. I think one of the subtleties is if you look at people and think, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want it to be, you know, wrong. Um, if you look at people and you think, the first thing I see about you is that you're in pain. That's who they see in you. Someone who sees their pain and isn't afraid of their pain and isn't threatened by their pain or isn't annoyed by their pain. Just someone who has a heart who sees their pain and doesn't want to fix them, doesn't want to train them, doesn't want to you know, tell them how to live, just wants to be on their journey. If, if you need me, I'll be on your journey with you. And I see pain and I feel pain because I see it. And those people tend to sort of want to talk to you. Um, can't fix them. I can't solve your problems. I can't, I can't guide you. I can't give you, you know, exactly the right advice, but I can tell you that there are people on your journey with you. And those are the Christians that I see in my business that I most admire. That's people good. who are, are so joyful and wide open mm -hmm. and yet they still do their work they still work hard they do their job but they're welcoming that they give they tell you that my christianity tells me to welcome you and to feel your pain that's good and that's uh, good. and that's what i've tried to emulate i you can't I can't assess how well I've done it, but I know that when I see it, and I know that's what I admire. Thanks so much for being on here. We really appreciate it. And by the way, thank you for your very kind endorsement for my new book, Ideas on a Deadline. There's a lot of great like gems in there. So yeah, no, there's a whole heart. You're, you're very kind. Well, thank you so much for being a part of it. My pleasure. Thanks, Phil. See you soon. I just want to thank Fred for that incredible interview. He's had such a long career, such an amazing career. It's always good to hear and be mentored by people who have been there. So I appreciate it. And you know, Fred wrote a great endorsement from my new book, Ideas on a Deadline, How to Be Creative When the Clock is Ticking. I would encourage you to get it. You know, if you're a creative person, even if you don't think of yourself as creative necessarily, but you have deadlines, you have to come up with great plans, great strategies, great ideas. 
you have to really work under the clock. All of us do in this incredibly distracted world we live in today. This is the book for you. Ideas on a Deadline, How to Be Creative When the Clock is Ticking. Fred wrote me a great endorsement for the book and based on his long career in the industry. And I think if you really want to really grow your creativity and create ideas when you need them the most, this is the manual you need to have. You need to get this book because it will change your view of creativity for the future. Thanks again for watching. Now, sh share this with your friends. If you have up and coming, if, if you have friends who are up and coming actors, I'd encourage you to share this with them or other people who are creative in the industry. Maybe this episode could really have an impact on them. Give us your comments. I love to hear your ideas and your feedback. We'll make changes and suggestions. I'd love for you to tell me more subjects you'd be interested in, and we'll pursue those in the future. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.